So uh, three weeks ago, we, three or four weeks ago now, we did some Lectio Divina here. I don't know if, if you were here, you'll remember, we went through a passage, and it was the passage right after Easter uh, where Jesus appears in the room with the disciples and um, shows him his hands and his feet. And we did that in the form of Lectio Divina, divine reading. And I had you close your eyes and I read through it. I, I asked you to kind of put yourself in the place of uh, somebody in that passage, you know. So maybe you were one of the disciples, maybe you were Thomas in that passage. And then we read through it again. And I want to tell you the reason that it is important to meditate on Scripture. It's important to study Scripture. We need to know what the Scriptures say, but it is also important to meditate on the Scriptures, to go through it, the same passage, over and over again, and really put ourselves in those positions. And I'm going to tell you why, because God did something Friday night. He smacked me in the face, actually, with the passage that we're going to talk about this week. So I've been going through this passage every day for the week, just reading it over and over and over. And Friday night, I'm at Tops, and I have to pick up some, some last-minute stuff for Amelia's birthday party that was Saturday. And it was the weirdest night at Tops that I have ever experienced. It, it was just bizarre, the things going on in Tops with some of the people there. And uh, I'm leaving Tops, and I have this just this bad ad. I'm thinking, okay, you've seen those Walmart people YouTube videos um, we generally, I don't watch those because it's just making fun of people and they're kind of mean. Um, but that's all I could think of as I'm walking back to my car and God smacks me in the face and says, from the passage we're going to talk about, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. Who are you to say who is going to come to me and who isn't? Who needs me and who doesn't? So God smacked me in the face with the passage that we're going to talk about today in a very convicting way that would not have happened if I hadn't been meditating on his word all week long to where I know the passage kind of inside and out. When we put ourselves in that position, God can speak to us through these things. So in this passage, again, we can put ourselves in different positions. Today, we're going to look at this passage from the perspective of the, what they're called, the circumcised believers, so the Jewish believers. But when God smacked me in the face, he put me in the position of Peter. Let me see it through the perspective of Peter. Don't call anything unclean that I have called clean. But if you would open up with me, we're going to be in Acts 11, and we're going to read verses 1 through 18. I'm sorry, it's I think I gave Casey the wrong information. To be honest with you, I think I had the wrong information too. I had it wrong on my sheet the other day as I was preparing too. You know, before we read this again, with Friday night, I don't share that as a proud moment. But I share that as, look, God will work in us and convict us and change us and grow us through his word. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. 
The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who was called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Would you uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your word that you have given us that we may know you. Because, Father, we know that we can know of you. We can know that you exist, but we cannot truly know you apart from what you have revealed to us. We cannot truly know you apart from your word. So, Father, we thank you for giving us your word. And we pray today that you would speak to each one of us through your word that you would reveal yourself to us in a mighty way. We pray that each one of us today, when we leave here, would look a little more like your son, Jesus. That we would be holy as you are holy, Father. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Jewish believers in this passage, they were critical of Peter for uh, taking the message to the Gentiles. Now, that doesn't make sense to us today. I mean, the Gentiles lived nearby. They were all around him. They didn't look different. There was, you know, but for some reason, you know, the Jews, well, they were told not to associate with the Gentiles. But this was a big deal. You didn't eat with Gentiles. You didn't go and do things with them. You certainly shouldn't be taking the word of God to them. So they were critical of Peter taking this message to him. And we can think that uh, that is absurd Because why wouldn't we want to take the good news to everybody? But the reality is, they responded the same way we often respond. They responded in the flesh. We tend to react and respond in the flesh as well. Which means that we tend to get protective or even selfish about things, about how things should be done or how people should look. You ever experience that in a church? We get protective about some really dumb stuff. You know, there's churches that have divided over the carpet. The carpet was being changed and this half the church didn't like the color that they were changing it to. So they split. We divide over some really dumb stuff. But there's other things that we must hold on to. And we have to be able to discern the difference between what is dogma, what is the stuff that we must hold on to, and what is just preference that doesn't really matter. You know, dogma are those things like the Apostles' Creed. Oh, the Apostles' Creed, you look at it up here. Um, It's things like the Apostles' Creed. It's those beliefs that the church has believed for 2,000 years. These are the things that we have to hold on to. We can't say that there isn't the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and still say we're Christians. That is dogma. That is important. But the preference things that don't matter, we can show a whole lot of grace in those. Especially when it comes to things like the style of music we want to listen to. But we have to be able to discern what is dogma and what is doctrine or in what is preference. And this isn't a new issue. This isn't something that's new in our church today. Jesus dealt with this with his disciples. In Mark 9, 38 to 41, um, actually, I've got to look it up for you. John was talking to Jesus and he says to him, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. But Jesus says to him, do not stop him. 
No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. You see, this person wasn't a part of their special little group. This person wasn't a part of their their clique, so he couldn't wear the team jersey or ride the team bus. He had to be kept at arm's length, and we couldn't trust him to do the things we're supposed to do. But Jesus says to John, no, that's not how this works. What he is doing is not wrong. Let him do it, because if he is performing miracles, if the Holy Spirit is working in him, then he is not against us and he is for us. The Spirit was clearly working in that man, but John was jealously trying to hold on to their little group doing these things. When people are not part of our clique or they don't fit into the, the mold that we, that we think it should look like, then some, we sometimes tend to disregard them and what God is doing in them and through them. So we must get better in the church at letting go of our preconceived notions about people who are different from us or or worship a little bit different from us. But at the same time, we still must be able to discern what is the truth of God and what are the lies of Satan. Like I said, there's a lot of things that we can disagree on. But we must hold tight to the things of God, the truth of God Jude is talking about this. In, and there's a bunch of verses in Jude. I'm going to read these to you. He's, she's sharing this with a church that, look, these are the things you have to hold on to. Jude says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was for once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals who condemn what was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment day on the great day. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of the dreams of these ungodly people, they pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. Woe to them, Jude says. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last time, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who will divide you, who will follow mere instincts and do not have the Holy Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Jude has some pretty harsh words for those certain individuals in the church that were teaching a new doctrine. He has some pretty harsh words for people in the church who are saying that the flesh is evil, so it doesn't matter what we do in the flesh. We can live any way we want, and because God's grace, he'll forgive us. He'll just keep forgiving us. We can live any way we want. Jude said this isn't the case. These are some of the dogma things we must hold on to. 
We are called to holy living. We cannot let that go. And we have to be able to discern what is of God and what isn't of God. So let's go back and look at Cornelius for a second. Was Cornelius of God? Was, the God, was God really working in him? And if we want the answer to that, we can go back a chapter in Acts. Acts 10, and it tells about Cornelius. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Cornelius, it says, was a devout and God-fearing man. That word for devout there is uh, usebes, which means to be pious, or as we would say today, be godly. Cornelius was a godly man in his obedience to the word of God and in his prayer in the Holy Spirit. Cornelius was a man of God. So was Peter right in going to Cornelius and making him part of the fold, part of the church? Yes. We didn't really need to examine that because the Holy Spirit told Peter to do it. But we can see why. We can discern that Cornelius was a holy man, obedient to God. But what about those certain individuals in this passage from Jude? You know, what was going on there? These individuals were preaching a message that was different from what the, what the apostles had shared. They were preaching a message that it didn't matter how you lived. They were preaching a message that many of them, the Gnostics, were teach, preaching a message that Jesus wasn't really even God. They were teaching a different message. We have to be able to discern between what is right, what is of God, and what is not. And Jude recognizes that this is not, and he says, woe to them. And then he goes further and he warns the true followers that there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires and that these are the people who will try to divide them, that follow their mere instincts over the Holy Spirit. But Jude encourages them that the true followers of Christ will build themselves up in faith and in prayer. They will build themselves up through obedience to the word of God and through prayer. He calls them to be like Cornelius. We must learn to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Because if they are of God, the people in our church who are given these messages, if they are of God, it doesn't matter what they look like or sound like or if they like worship music the same way that we do. It can be contemporary worship. It can be traditional worship. Those things don't matter but if they are not of God and they are sharing a message that is not matched with his word, then they are false prophets. And they are trying to pull us away from the word of God. And we must deny that person and not allow them to speak falsehoods into our lives. And this is a hard teaching because we want to love everyone. We don't want to offend anyone. So we want to let everyone have their own opinion. But when it comes to heresy... We must, as Jude says, contend for the faith. We don't use that word heresy anymore. But you know what the opposite of orthodox is? You know what the opposite of the teachings of the word of God is? It's heresy. And we must be willing to contend and fight against heresy, things that go against the word of God in our churches. And contend doesn't mean we just have a friendly discussion. It means that we really struggle with the issues. It means we really push that, no, this is not what the word of God says. We must follow the word of God. Contend means to fight. And it's funny to me the difference between Jude and Paul here. 
because Jude tells them, look, contend, fight in your church, really stand up for what is right, what is true. Paul just kicks them out. <laughs> so in 1 Corinthians, when there's a person living in, he's in a relationship with his dad's wife, so his stepmom, and he's proud of it. He's bragging about it. The whole church is just happy. Oh, look at us. We're so open-minded. It's okay that he's doing this. And Paul says, no, what is wrong with you people? Do you not know the word of God? And he says, kick him out. Kick him out. Not because we don't love him. Not because we don't want him to know Christ. Not because we don't want him in heaven. But because we want him to understand the truth of God's word. And he says, kick him out, that the Holy Spirit or that Satan will get a hold of him, and hopefully he'll hit rock bottom and turn back to God, back to the Holy Spirit. This is how we must contend against what is against the Word of God, but we have to be able to discern the messages, because we are bombarded with messages from every direction, and we're so quick to follow pastors who are in podcasts all over the nation or all over the world because they're famous, but we know nothing about the way they live. And if we don't know the Word of God, we know nothing about their message or if it matches with the Word of God. We have to be able to discern the messages that we are getting from all around us. The Apostle John understood the importance of this. There's a tradition in the early church that the Apostle John was in a bathhouse, a Roman bathhouse. So you've all seen movies where there's bathhouses and John is unclothed. Somebody just told me a story about how the YMCA, they used to swim naked there and it was just horrible. It was, he said, I don't know why my mom sent me to that. I don't think they do that anymore, thank God. But he's naked in this bathhouse, right? And a man named Serentis comes in and Serentis is one of the leaders of this Gnostic movement. And John is just in the water cleaning and all of a sudden he looks over and he sees Serentis in the bath with him. John jumps out of the tub and runs out of the building without clothes, up, and, and I don't know what the laws in Rome were about indecent exposure, but you know, don't do that here. But he gets out of the tub and he runs away. And why? He says, lest the building collapse because of the righteous judgment of God. What Serenthus was teaching was heresy. It was against the word of God. And John did not even want to be in the same room lest God's righteous judgment struck down the building with him in it. The Apostle John also understood the importance of being able to discern what is of God and what is not. So how do we discern who is of God and who is not of God? God works in his people by changing us first from the inside out. And we talked about this last week in my near disastrous demonstration with the water. As we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, as we put ourselves in a position for the Holy Spirit to fill us, we are changed from the inside. And when that happens, then we begin to bear fruit. Now, we've all heard that if we've read any part of, if we've read much of the Bible at all, you've probably come, about, come across a passage that talks about us bearing fruit. But what does it mean for us to bear fruit? I love the verse in John 15, and it's 4 through 9. Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. 
So object lesson time, because oftentimes we think of bearing fruit, and we think of it like this. We Hopefully you know the fruit of the Spirit. We Hopefully you know the song. The fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we say, well, I have love, or I have joy, or peace, or or faithfulness, and that they're all individual fruit. And that maybe I have this and this, and you have that and that, and that's God working, that's bearing fruit. But that's not really what the passage means. That's not really what it is when we bear fruit. Which is why I love John 15. He talks about the vine and the branches. Now, I grew up in Westfield, so where I grew up, we were surrounded by grapes, As a matter of fact, when I was in middle school, I would go work in the grapes for a few hours because my best friend couldn't play until he got at least two rows tied of grapes. So I didn't get paid, but I had no one else that would play with me, I guess. So I needed to help him finish his job. But you know what? And these are not good Westfield grapes. These are Topps grapes. This is why I was in Topps Friday night. This is what it's talking about with the fruit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When God is working in us and we bear fruit, it's not that we have this or this or this. All of the fruit will be growing in us. And now if you've seen grapes grow, generally they grow pretty much together. You don't see one or two popping up and the rest all little still. Some of them may be a little bit smaller, but they generally grow together. That is what the fruit in our life ought to look like. like. We ought to be bearing that fruit. We ought to be having that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this is what Paul tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. Because Paul doesn't start the chapter just talking about you're going to bear fruit, it's going to look like this. Paul says you're going to look one way or another. He says that the acts of the flesh are this. He says they're obvious. He says it's sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. It's not hard, shouldn't be hard, to look at one another and recognize the fruit that we're bearing. To recognize the acts that we're engaging in. Are we bearing fruit? Is the person that we are listening to bearing the fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, or are they still living that old lifestyle? We have to be able to discern when and where God is working. So as we look around and we try to discern who is of God and who isn't, how can we know for sure? It's very simple. It's this. Does your life look like this? I would say, does your life look like Jesus? But without this, you don't know what Jesus looked like. And that's where we come up with little things like, well, we need to love like Jesus loved. Well, all right, what does that look like? Because Jesus flipped tables in the temple. Jesus was never a doormat. Does your life look like Jesus' life? And the only way we can know is through this. 
and going back to that passage at the very beginning. You know, those circumcised believers, they criticized Peter. But the good thing was, was that they were open to what the Holy Spirit was doing. So when Peter explained it to them, and they recognized the Holy Spirit working, they rejoiced, they celebrated. Wow, God is bringing salvation even to the Gentiles. So how will we know, how will we discern truth if we don't know the word of God? Because here's the thing, though, about those uncircumcised believers. Had they understood the word of God to begin with? Had they understood all that had been written through the Old Testament? Had they understood Genesis 22? Had they understood Psalm 22? Had they understood Daniel 7, 14? Had they understood Isaiah 9, 42, 49, and 60? Had they understood much of the Old Testament, they would have known that it was always part of God's plan to bring the Gentiles into the fold. The Holy Spirit did reveal it to them. But had they known and understood the word of God to begin with, there would have been no question. Do you know the word of God well enough that you can look and listen to what people are saying to you and look at how people are living and recognize whether it is of God or not? And if you can't say yes to that, that's a scary place to be because our Our eternity depends upon it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, again, we thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for the ways you are working in people and growing people that I look around all the time and I see people in this church getting closer to you. I hear their stories about how they're hungering and thirsting after you, Lord. Father, I thank you and praise you for the work you're doing in our church. We thank you that we have been able to be a light in the darkness, that we have been able to to be a light and a hope in our community for so many people. Father, continue to work in and through our church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ways you have provided for this church, the ways you have blessed this church. We thank you for the tithe that um, is provided today, Father. We pray for your wisdom and discernment for our leadership team and um, our finance team, how every cent is spent, Father that every cent would be spent to build your kingdom here on earth. Father, again, we thank you and praise you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I wanted to read um, a benediction for you out of Jude to send us home. And then I didn't mark Jude, so it's... I don't remember where Judah, no, I know where Judah is. <laughs> <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.